It's party time, Mom. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Chad Prather Show. Good to be with you guys here in Studio 22. And got a great episode for you coming up today. Fun things to talk about. Going to be very informative. I think you're going to learn some things today that, uh, some questions. Those of you who watch this program or listen in via your podcast subscriber uh, or distributor, I think you're going to, you're going to learn some, because I, I see your comments. You, you guys send me messages and, and, and things, and, and this is going to answer some of your questions, I believe. I think we're going to get there. As always, over in the peanut gallery, party foul Steve sitting over there looking bored. Look, he put on a collared mm-hmm. shirt today. A this collar is shirt. impressive. <laughs> Look at you. Way to dress up, Thank Steve. You. I mean, you talk about taking I'm, it. I'm it's like you're going to a dance or so. something. Yeah, Lee. That's not a mullet, folks. That's real hair. That is all the way down. Um, and, of course, over here driving the Starship, we got the puppet master himself, Mark, sitting at the helm, making sure everybody knows what's going on. And Candice, the queen of the Ethiopians, she is the brains behind this operation, as everybody knows. And uh, we got, we're going to have to get Candice, queen of the Ethiopian, T-shirts made. Don't, you, you don't want that? Yeah, no, I think we're going to do it. <laughs> I think it's a fantastic idea. We're even going to put Acts chapter 8 on there. Even though it's different than the biblical Candace. We're going to put, we're going to put, yeah. Just to clear up the confusion. Just to make sure, so people have a point of reference. Absolutely, I love it. Sitting here in Studio 22, in the hot seat, he took his time, because there's so many other things that he could be doing today. I could be sleeping. The one, the only, Mr. Glenn Beck. How are you? (laughs) Good. Thanks for coming in. You bet. I think I asked you a while back, I said, after all these years of doing radio, talk, and TV, at what point in time did you get tired of doing this? I think you said about 86. <laughs> yeah. No, you know, tired of doing it, um, really never, because I like doing different things. Tired of hearing me? <laughs> oh, my gosh, long ago. So I've always said that because, you know, when I got into this shtick of sitting in the truck and running my mouth, my idea was how fast can I say something and get information out in 60 seconds? Because to me, nobody wants to watch a talking head right. longer than that. Mm-hmm. Because I would, if it were left to me, I wouldn't watch any of this stuff. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't watch myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's fascinating to me that people let me waste their time by doing it because I don't want to see me. I don't want to hear me. And, and you know, I, I do it only for my mother. When you kind of, when you, when you, uh, understand how valuable your time is and your time is no more valuable than their time it <laughs> it actually weighs on you you're like oh man i i'm gonna waste your time today yeah. and now <laughs> i've got guilt yeah, yeah i got guilt i'm sorry but i want to say something and and i've been obviously like many people can say this i've been watching and listening to you for years and i can say beyond the shadow of a doubt i've never listened in tuned in or watched you where i did not learn something thank you or something didn't make me say hmm that's something to think about. That's right. I agree with that. And do you see yourself? It, it, you're, the thing that has always set you apart in my mind is I believe that you truly communicate what you're saying with conviction. You're not just reporting the news or facts or political stances. You actually have a so, moral <laughs> sense of conviction about what you're saying. You know, I think I would be... Um, I'd be a completely different man if it wasn't for alcoholism. Mm-hmm. You know, I got into radio when I was 13. Um, I didn't, at 13, you don't know who you are. Um, and I learned a craft at 13. And I was around really good people. And I studied these people, you know. Um, and I saw how they, how they crafted things. Because uh, I was in top 40 radio mornings. And... 18 it's a craft i know exactly what you're doing at what time and and what you're interested in it wasn't necessarily things that were interesting to me i was just helping you get up in the morning and have a good time uh and uh so it was it was pretty much meaningless nonsense and not me and i was completely a different person Mm -hmm. uh and um and not a good person and alcohol is you know alcoholism and and everything else and because i bottomed out and i had nothing i lost everything um including my family uh, my my fortune my job my fame anything and all <clears throat> all i wanted back was my credibility mm. uh, that's that's the only thing that meant anything to me i wanted to be able to look a man in the eye and say i'm telling you the truth and them not go, hmm, are you? Uh, and so I promised myself, 
actually in the waters of, of baptism. Uh, I promised God, you give me forgiveness, you give me a new chance, I won't blow it. I'm not going to destroy, I won't knowingly do anything to destroy my credibility. Yeah. Because I know you sat down a, a little while back with Samantha B. Yeah. And you had that interview, and, and you, on that, you basically said, I'm sorry for the things that I've done. You know, and you've you've openly said, look, there are things I wish I could go back and do differently, say differently, feel differently. You know, you wrote. But at the same time, I, I you know, what people are not hearing is uh, if I went back with the same amount of knowledge, mm -hmm. I think I would do it exactly the same way because I I was honestly soul searching. I wasn't. I was saying the things that I that I believed with yeah. conviction, but I was also balancing it with how do I get? Doesn't matter how much conviction you have and how much truth you have if no one is listening to it. So how do I take something like Fox News? How do I take a platform like talk radio and make it entertaining enough to get people to listen to have them go? Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Wait a minute! There's some truth there. What is that? Tell me about that. And so it's the, the mixing, like Jon Stewart did and nobody had a problem with. It's the right. mixing of entertainment and enlightenment, as we say on our show, that is uh, very difficult. Very difficult. Because if society doesn't want to be forgiving, if you're not, if you're not in the popular uh, mindset, they, they will destroy you. Yeah. And they did. They only took the things and and took things out of context many times. Some things I did say in context. A lot of it was not in context. Yeah. How thick is your skin, in your opinion? Um, probably thicker than most, but I don't care who you are. Um, everybody wants to be liked. Yeah. And that's the real balance. Yeah. The real balance is, um, is having the guts when you know it is who you are or what you believe or what you believe is right, um, still moving forward and saying it, knowing yeah. that this is not going to make you popular. So that's the thing that I, and that's the point I'm getting to, is, is that's what I've always appreciated about you, is that sense of transparency. Because you do speak from conviction, but then you come in and you say, look, I'm a man. I'm feeble. I'm frail. We all are. I, I, I admittedly, you know, the folks that follow and listen to me over the years, they know they've, they've heard me talk about my depression, the things that I've done where literally I was trying to commit suicide by default through, you know, drinking myself to death mm -hmm. or exhausting myself to death because mm -hmm. I got to a point where I thought there's no reason to keep living the vanity of this life. It's one more lap to nowhere. Where are you heading? And that's why I say I feel like when you come out, you're saying things from a point of conviction. And you've because been Because I've same, been there. You've been there. I've been there. I've been right where you were. Yeah. Um, uh, and... I'd be dead if I had courage, <laughs> but at the time I didn't have any courage. It was, it was too frightening to yeah. kill myself. Yeah. Um, and it's the only thing that stopped me. I prayed every day, pull your car into a bridge abutment. I, it was on I-84 in Louisville, Kentucky. I can tell you which bridge it was every day for, oh, I don't even know, almost two years. I prayed going to work and coming home from work. Do it, do yeah. it. Give me the strength, do it. And I know the average person who has seen you over the years, known you from a celebrity status, they look at this or hear that and they think, why? You have everything in the world. You've accomplished everything. You've all, been successful. All that and they just is, don't get that. All that stuff's meaningless. Yeah. It's meaningless. The only thing, money only complicates your life. It also, I mean, I've lived in the days where I am counting my pennies at the at the gas station. Mm -hmm. So I am not that 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 money helps that go away, the stress between you and your wife go away where you are like I'm doing everything I can just to meet the bills. That sucks. Yeah. And okay, so I'm not talking about that that but when you get to a place to where you're stable, money just makes the same it just highlights the same things yeah um it's just it's um 
it just complicates. It allows you to do great things, but nothing really changes in your life. The only thing that money changes private air travel <laughs> it definitely does <laughs> that it's, a, it's a far that, more comfortable way to yeah, go that one is life-changing yeah a good friend of mine said to me years ago and it stuck with me he said i it's not that i want 40 million dollars i want to know that god can trust me with 40 million dollars but a great there's thing. a huge difference in that because i've always said if i quote won the lottery you know what i start just giving millions of dollars to family i wouldn't do that because i don't know that that might destroy them because money I, all of I a sudden to, gives you liberty. I have to tell you, it, it, one of the biggest, I, I, when I first started getting into real money, mm -hmm. um, uh, to where money, to where you're just like, I, really? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is craziness. Um, everybody comes out of the woodwork. Yeah. And, and when, you're, when it's new, you uh, first, your first instinct is, I can help you. Let yeah. me help you. Um, and I had a guy call me once and he said, Glenn, and I knew he was in trouble financially and he was a really nice guy. And, uh, I knew that the church was helping him out and yada, yada, yada. And I think his mother was sick or something. Uh, and he said, I just need like a thousand dollars and I can fly overseas and go see her and yada, yada, yada. And I could do it. But something in me said say this instead have you talked to the bishop hmm. and he said uh yeah i have but i thought i would call you and i said okay well let me think about it i called the bishop and the bishop said glenn i'm going to ask you to do the hardest thing you've ever done i know you can write that check i know you want to write that check i know you feel that's the right thing to do and it's pulling on every heartstring in you don't write the check hmm. And I said, why? And he said, because we are trying so hard to keep him in this framework. And every time there's any kind of struggle, it's not like his mom is dying. Anytime there's any kind of struggle, he immediately reaches out and goes past that framework. He's not living the principles he has to live to be able to dig himself out of that hole. Yeah. Um, and it's you can destroy people. Money can destroy you. Yeah. And those around you. Very fast. Very fast. Very, very fast. And that's why people ask me all the time. They say, okay, you've had some element of success. Has it changed you? Has it affected you? Had it happened to me when I was 24, I would probably mm. be dead already. The fact that that level of success happened to me, or at least that platform happened to me at the age of 40, I'm 46 now, Yeah, I was able to handle because it didn't change who I am as a person. I'd already hit rock bottom, and as my friend Gary Chapman says, you get down there, you'll see my name scribbled on the wall three or four times. Mm. Um, and once you've done that and you've been broken, it you handle that a completely different you way. You know um, that success, fame, money, and failure and poverty are all imposters. Yeah. That's not who I am. That's not... It's not going to fix me. It's not going to. It's not going to break me. Yeah, yeah. I, I always echo back the you know the words of Kipling in his poem "If" when he says yeah. you know you take uh, success and, and disaster and treat those two imposters, imposters the, just same. the same. Yep. And so that's always echoed with me because they really are. They're they're yep. both a lie. They, they are. And, and their folks are listening to this thing right now. You thinking, well, if I had this, it would make my life better. Or if I could get out of this, trust. Let's listen. If you're in the desert place, or you're you're in that broken place, trust that process right now. You're in exactly the place. I hated it when people said this. Yeah. You're exactly where you're supposed to be. Yeah. Shut up. <laughs> you're not here. It's tough. It's awful. You know, you're not worried about <laughs> yeah. am I going to be able to make the payment yeah. next week? Yeah. Uh, so it sucks. Yeah. But. And then nobody believes this and nobody wants to hear it. But it, my success has caused, has been um, the uh, flattest learning curve of my life. Mm. My biggest struggles, it's almost straight up learning curve. Mm -hmm. And you need those straight up learning curves yeah. Uh, and you can so easily go dead inside when you, when you have it, Yeah. when you have it. Cause you, when everything's going right, what do I have to think about? Yeah. Oh, I better, I better check my attitude. I better check this. I better check that. Unless you're a really well-balanced person, you ain't doing any soul searching at that point. No. Cause I'm happy. No. 
No, the only the only time you learn anything or, or is when you're uncomfortable. Yeah, it it really is true. You got to, and that's why I think in this day and age, thinking has become so taboo because people don't want to do it. It's they don't want to be do. uncomfortable. Thinking is uncomfortable. Yeah, critical thinking has been has been done with, and that's why I've always appreciated what you've done. I've appreciated the way you can graphically put those things out. You know, people talk about the chalkboard and things like that. Mm. It's genius. And and one of the things, and I want to talk about this. I want to, I want your opinion on it. It's really I, not. It's, it, it, no, it's a it's, simple, but it's, man. it's simple genius it's, is what no, it is. It's just a simple guy going, I don't know how to use technology <laughs> and I, I can't afford these big things. Let's just put it up on a chalkboard. Put it on a chalkboard. But it's right. I mean, it's 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 it puts it in front of people. And there it is. And I think that – so we live in – so throughout history, people have always put their stories on a wall, whether it was a cave drawing or a hieroglyphic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These days we're putting it on a digital wall through social media things of that nature. Historically, we only kept for posterity's sake the voices of the prophets and the poets and the philosophers mm-hmm. and the kings. These days, everybody has a voice. No one has responsibility for that voice because everybody has a social media platform and everybody's putting all this pablum out there and everybody suddenly is a geopolitical expert out mm-hmm. there and they, they know everything there is to know. Mm-hmm. But talking about stories on the wall, one of the things that I think that our culture these days has lost the art of and the skill of is storytelling, mm. and I think you're a master storyteller. What Thank are the you. elements to storytelling that have been lost that need to be recaptured? What's the art to it? I don't think I've ever been asked that question. Um, That's why we're here, Glenn. Hmm. Uh, and the good thing, the good thing, the audience is here because I have a really crappy answer. Um, uh, I, I would say. Um, the conviction of the storyteller, mm-hmm. the 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 fact that the storyteller can see it and feel it, and is, you know, a good storyteller is is someone who is a good observer. You know, you you talk to a storyteller, and um, you both witness the same event. And one will just give you the facts, and the other will tell you the hues of the sky, will tell you the feelings mm. of the people around. Will They notice and they feel it. So it's internalizing it first. Um, and and being, being able to um, connect with that, surf that emotion, if you will, um, when, if you can, if you can do that, as I struggle for words, if you can put that into words, you have it. Yeah. You have it. I think people wonder why is that important? To me, we have millennia of history that is based on oral tradition, people passing down stories to their children, to the next generation. And these days we're allowing the revisionists to tell us the stories based on their interpretation of history. So let me tell you something. Yeah, I just was at a uh, a uh, Memorial Day celebration with a family, and they invited us there. And everybody in this family, there were generals, you know, colonels. By the uh, way, Glenn Beck doesn't just hang out with the neighborhood kids. He goes where there's colonels and generals. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it was it it was just this amazing family. Right. And so there's about fifty of them in this family, and uh, they have a tradition that every year they tell a story that the father, their father, now the kids, grandfather and great-grandfather, told them that he heard himself from firsthand from the guy who shot the biggest grizzly bear ever in the lower 48, okay? Um, it was a 10 and a half foot grizzly bear. And its skull was actually, for a long time, in the Smithsonian. It's this okay. enormous <clears throat> skull of this bear. And it's the story about how this one guy in the middle of the night killed this bear and and how he felt afterwards. He wasn't happy about it. He looked at this magnificent bear and, and wept. And it's just such a great story, and I'm listening to it. But he's telling this story um, not like a storyteller. He's just telling the story as he heard it, uh, and he's got the facts written down. And one of the great Karen Kirk kids raises their hand halfway through because he's he says and he came up and he he shot him and he i think he had a it was like a 20 
2840 or some bullet I had never even heard of, little teeny, just, mm-hmm. just over a 22, and shot this giant bear. And the kid said, where did he shoot him? Now, me, I could go for 20 minutes where that bullet hit that bear and how it ripped through the fr- flesh and that, that, that skin of that bear was an inch thick. And so that bullet, I mean, I could go off on that. This guy said, you know, I don't know. And I could make something up, but that would be wrong of me because mm. then we wouldn't be able to tell the story uh, from f- fact from fiction. And by the time you are standing at the campfire, you'll question if this story is even real. Wow. And I sat there, jaw drop, looking at them thinking, this family has so much honor and credibility. Not a lot of fun in storytelling around a campfire, <laughs> but so much credibility. And I thought of my grandparents. Yeah. When my grandfather died, there are so many unbelievable stories of my grandfather. My grandfather uh, uh, never made it past the third grade. He was the chief uh, machinist at Boeing uh, in his time in the 60s and 70s. Um, he he couldn't, and nobody at Boeing knew he couldn't read except my uncle. My uncle was was in the office, and when they had a really tough part to make, my uncle knew he couldn't read, so he would always be there by my grandfather's side, and he'd say, now see, Ed, these are the, the plans, and you see over here, this is blah, 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 and my grandfather would just play along and go, I know, but he didn't. Yeah. Um, but he was he was the best storyteller ever. And when I was a kid, I didn't realize that my grandfather, we would come in and he would take off his boots. We'd be working on the farm and he'd take off his boots in the back of the house. And I'd be sitting in the other chair across from him, taking off my shoes. And, and he'd start telling me a story. And I'd hear grandma in the other room and she'd only say one word. Through every memory I have, my grandfather telling a story, I only remember my hearing my grandmother say one word. And that was Edward. That was his name, <laughs> Edward. And he would stop and he'd look to grandma and then he'd say come here and i'd come a little closer and she'd say edward and he'd stop he'd get a little quieter i'd get a little closer until i was right at his feet and he was just whispering these lies to me okay (laughs) when he died i went back to my grandmother and my aunt and i said okay i've got a few stories i gotta i gotta know is this true is this true is this true is this true my grandmother even said on some of those stories, could be. <laughs> Not sure. Could be. We, we're the exact opposite of that family. Yeah. You got to tell those stories. I mean, you, you really to. do. They're Families fun. have to tell those stories. It's, there's, there's an art to it. There's a fun element to it. I so, I, I hate it when I see it with my kids. And I, I just, it makes me so sad when I see, especially when grandparents are at the table and the kids are on their devices. I mean, those stories, we didn't want to hear those stories either, most of them. Yeah. We were forced to sit there every Christmas and don't get up from the table and you listen to the stories and the family's talking, we're having dinner, sit down. And you sat there and you listened to them and you know them because you heard them over and over and over again. But that is part of the, that's part of the process. And now my my kids, my, my wife's parents came down. They have the greatest stories. When I met her grandmother, her grandmother was from, uh, her grandmother's mother was from Italy and they're still the talk with your hands half of it is in an italian kind of family okay right. when 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 my wife first said to me um we were dating she said you know what let's just come over go, go over to my house or your house do you have stuff to make spaghetti and i said oh yeah sure came over i'm on the phone and she's in the kitchen and she's reading this label of ragu and and puzzled and she's holding a pan and the ragu and i said What's wrong? And she said, I just opened this and put it in a pan and that's it. And I'm like, yeah, 
<laughs> that was the last time we ever had right. ragu or any kind of processed uh, spaghetti sauce. Uh, so she's from that family. And I'm sitting with her grandmother one Christmas, and we're sitting at the table, and we're the last two to get up. And I said, how did the family get over here? And she said, well, I'll tell you the story of my, my mother. She said, uh, my mother was, my father was a very bad man. And I had kind of heard about this, that he had died early, but he was a, just a tyrant, a really bad guy. And she said, my father was a really bad man. She said, but my mother was just sweet. Now, this is Lena telling me this, and she's just this plump, she looks like one of those apple people, you know, yeah. who you put the clothes for eyes, yeah. and then they just kind of sink in, and they become this soft little face. She's just this angelic woman sitting there, and she says, um, my mother knew that this man liked her and had said for years, she's going to be my wife. And my mom and my mom's family wanted nothing to do with him because we knew what he was like. So my family worked hard and they gathered the money and they sent me from, or they sent her from Italy over to New York. She said, I didn't know anybody and I'm living there and I'm making my way through and a year later, there's a knock on my door, and I'm living in this little apartment, and I open up the door, and there he is. And he says, Lena, I finally have found you. I have been tearing myself apart. I haven't been able to eat or sleep. I love you so much. And uh, she's standing there, and she's looking at him, and he says, and I have come to find you and have you as my wife. And if I can't have you, I swear to God, I'll cut you. <laughs> <laughs> and then she just stops and looks at me and smiles. <laughs> like, okay, that's it. We should work on that ending. <laughs> Lena, we should work on that ending. But those are the stories <laughs> yeah. that you miss. Yeah. And that's one of the beauties of storytelling is that unexpected ending. Yeah. That, that thing's like, oh, yeah. whoa. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I swear to God, I'll cut you. But you know that's truth. <laughs> and so they married. And, yeah. uh... <laughs> and they have the scars to prove yeah. it. That's funny. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. I, I really do. It's, it's one of those, it's always been a big passion of mine, that storytelling thing, and being able to convey that truth and i can still tell the stories of my grandparents that are so funny and so good we stood up for hours at my grandfather's funeral years ago and and i spoke at it and we just told stories and then we opened the microphones up and for another hour people just came up and told their stories of, of what they knew and the things they'd heard and it's just it, you so, never, never leaves you so here's the here's the problem let's expand storytelling a little mm -hmm. bit there's such a thing as visual storytelling and it's completely lost now Visual storytelling is that horrible picture of you or your sister with her eyes crossed at the family, in the family portrait. That stupid one where they're blowing out a birthday cake and somebody standing behind them just looking like a moron. Yeah. Okay. The error pictures of your family where it captures something screwy. We delete those. We filter everything. My son, I was just up at the the ranch, and I took this picture of of the cattle out on the on the on the ranch, and he said, "Dad, let me show you something." I said, "Okay," and I took it, and I'm like, I'm looking at, it, I'm like, this is just so beautiful, and he said, "Yeah, look at this," and he filters it, mm -hmm. and it changes the colors, but and it looks better, but it doesn't look like that. And I'm like, dude, stop filtering your life. Yeah. Stop it. That's not real. Mm. My daughter went. Um, we have a we have about a 7,800 foot mountain in our in a back of our ranch, and they went uh, hiking. And she went about halfway up. And he went all the way. She came back, and you know what she said to me, Dad, you have to go up there. I swear to you. It looks just like a green screen. Wow. What? She, her viewpoint was 
the green screen was real Reality. and beautiful. That's what you strive for. And I'm like, no, honey, it looks like nature. Green screens <laughs> <laughs> reflect nature, yeah. not the other way around. <laughs> that's fascinating. And that's a, it's a telling commentary on the world is way, the way we, quote, see it, uh, and that's quite literally. only going to get worse. Technology that's coming our way. Yeah. Is you know there there was this thing uh, that came out about Martin Luther King horrible if it's true and they say that they have tapes the FBI of him saying horrible stuff blah blah blah, blah but they're not going to come out until 2027. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, if the government is holding anything, anything, video or audio, that's bad but important, it needs to come out in the next 18 months, right? Because because deep fakes are going to be so prevalent by 2027 it's not going to matter yeah. no one will believe any of that right now this is the last time period of man think of this the last time period of man being able to hear or see and believe their eyes mm -hmm. we recently had jamie metzler on the show he is a futurist and is dealing with this phenomena of genetic engineering and mm. you can pick and choose the color of the eyes of your baby mm. welcome the, dr you know, mengele exactly you know all the way down to this idea of super soldiers it's something that's happening actively in china right now it's unregulated of course we have to do it because we can't let one country deal with this while we're not dealing with it because then you have this uneven balance of 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 genetic dynamics that are going on and and so now we're in this race to, to figure out okay in the next 10 years how so we're at a point now where nature to use your term a minute ago with the green screen is is actually being relegated to the back row while we create what your mind should believe so if you have green eyes or blue eyes would you have really or would did we just concoct that in a dna petri dish and and create that and that's happening on a digital level it's happening on a dynamic level in so many different ways with social media which i've always said i'd love to punch and kiss mark zuckerberg in the mouth at the same time in one element i love social media and another i think it's the downward spiral of civilization what do you think about that would you want to live in the garden of eden before or after the fall before i i, I think it wouldn't stay unfallen very long if i were in it <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, uh, I wouldn't want to live in the Garden of Eden before mm -hmm. the fall. Um, you know, it's the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil that they ate from. Um, you, I lived in Tampa for a while. I've lived in Seattle. Right. Boy, do you love the sun when it comes out. Mm -hmm. You know, you spend about 20 minutes going, it's normal that the sky is on fire. It's normal the sky is on fire. <laughs> um, but when you, when you see the sun and it's a beautiful day, oh my gosh, every, you know you're in Seattle. It's the only, I've lived all over the country. It is the only place, maybe on the earth, but definitely in the country, where they'll say to you on a sunny day, have you seen the mountains? You can see the mountains today. They say that every time. Have right. you seen the mountains? You can see the mountains today. Okay? I've lived in Tampa. I've lived in Arizona, which is beautiful. Beautiful. Same. All the time, it's the same. Tampa. It's always sunny. It's always nice. It's always, you know, hot. Always. You're, you're never, you're not cold in Tampa. I don't care what time of year it is, you're not cold. You're in a state of not as hot as you usually are, okay? Yeah. It's boring. It's boring. We, we, we look at um, downfalls, struggles, uh, uh, imperfections, and we want to erase them all. There, there's going to come a time, and I think we're already, I saw a, an oil of Olay. Is that the right, is that a product, right? Oil of Olay? Mm -hmm. A uh, skincare product, and I saw this model, and she beautiful face, but she had like I don't know uh, beyond freckles. They were big like birthmarks. She had several of them on her neck, uh, one on her face, but she had like eight of them or so on her neck, and it was a little, it was a little like whoa, because it was so odd you didn't see it. 
And I thought to myself, you would have never, ever, she would have never had a chance of being a skincare person being held up as beautiful 20 years ago. Right. But now everything is so airbrushed, every imperfection is gone. That is beautiful. It's natural. It's authentic. Mm -hmm. Authentic anything is critical. I mean, I, I was in Rome in the 80s, and it was <laughs> Rome. Okay? It was different. I've been back in the 90s, and I was back just a few years ago. You go now, I might as well go to Epcot. Right. It's all the same restaurants. It's all the same everything. I mean, it's real, but I can see that anywhere. Mm -hmm. I want the authentic experience. I was reading, I was reading a Brad Thor novel recently. And when I'm reading those novels, I always learn things when I read Brad Thor. He's right? great. You know, because because beyond the 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 fun aspect of the Scott Harveth novels, he he teaches you something. You learn I, things through. I Brad called Thor. his. I coined a term for him. Uh, he doesn't write fiction. He writes faction. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, excellent point. So every now and then I'll be laying there in bed. My wife will roll over and she's like, "What are you looking at?" And I said, "I'm looking at satellite images of Kabul." Why? I said, "Because I'll never go there." I, I doubt that I'll ever go to Kabul. I want to see what it looks like. I want to see this the best images I could see. Like right now, I want to see what this looks like. Why? Well, because I'm reading this Scott Harveth novel by Brad Thor, and he's talking about Kabul, mm -hmm. and I want to see if this is if he's talking about an actual street mm -hmm. that's in Kabul, and I'm just looking at this thing. And so it's amazing this world we live in, where like that we can transport ourselves to the other side of the world. We were in Rome last year, and I'm showing, I'm telling my wife the exact same thing. I said I feel like we've entered a theme park here. Yeah. It's a different, it's not what it was, you know, years ago uh, when I was there, say, in the 90s. And so it's it's a different deal. And so Nothing this, is real. Nothing is real. You go back to the image a few years ago, what was it, 2009, 2010, where they had the, the black and gold dress, or did you see a blue and white dress? Yep, and yep. you're seeing that, and yep. everybody's divided on this thing. Mm -hmm. It's like when you used to walk through the mall, and they had those jumbled pictures, and if you could squint, you could see through mm -hmm. it and see the image that was in there. You either see it or you don't see it. And so many times today, people are so caught up in the jumbled image. You take the Mueller report now. That Mueller comes out the other day. They spent two years on this thing. Yep. My opinion is, I think Mueller and his crew probably knew immediately there was no collusion, but they had to carry it out for two years, long enough to let Trump, who's going to go off like a firecracker, give him enough time to create obstruction of justice charges. So now people are saying, well, he's been guilty this whole time. Was he? Or did we create an atmosphere of perception whereby we were going to let him make himself guilty? You, if you know anything about Donald Trump, and I know Donald Trump, mm -hmm. you know anything about Donald Trump, you know how he's going to react every time. Sure. You say nice things to him, he's going to be your best friend. You see bad things, he is going to treat you like an enemy. You can piss him off. You can get him. The th you want to get Donald Trump to start a war. You get all of the minds around him, all the popular minds, and you go in and say, whatever you do, Mr. President, do not do this. And he's eventually going to go, yeah. you know what, you son of a, I'm doing that. <laughs> you see okay? that red button right yeah, there? I'm, I'm going to push, push it. it. I'm going to push it just because you don't want me to push it. <laughs> so that's that's who Donald Trump is. If you look at what happened with the obstruction thing and where they have him on obstruction, right. do they have him on obstruction or do they have a guy who is who you know his personality that you've antagonized and antagonized and antagonized. It's like a like a, a bullfighter going, and then the bull just attacked me. Yeah. Of course he did. That's a bull, and you were standing there shoving spears into him and and taking a red cape in front of him, throwing it at him all the time. Yeah. Of course he's going to charge. Yeah. So that happened, and when you know he tried to fire him. Oh, really? No kidding. You mean to tell me that he's innocent of what you've been looking at, and then you start looking into obstruction, and you expect that bull not to say, fire that son of a bitch. I am tired of this. You expect him not to do that? Yeah. It's, it's, it's plausible enough for, I think, most of the country to go, you know what? I would have said exactly the same thing if you had done that to me. And I'm not guilty of obstruction. I won the election. Nobody helped me. I wasn't colluding. I played fairly. I just played a different game, and none of you liked it. That's how I won. Yeah.
And that's that's that perception thing. Half the country looks at this and says, well, it's this way. The other half looks at it and says it's this way. Well, at what point in time though? do we come through and say this, forget perception, What what's real? We, we already have. You look at the ratings the week that Mueller report comes out. The ratings for um, uh, for all cable news, way down. Not one network had more than 500,000 people, 2554, watching it last mm. week at any given time. What? I mean, that's kind of the bad ratings that I used to get at CNN headline news, okay? that that Those were fireable ratings. Right. You'd be fired if you would have had those ratings at CNN, MSNBC, or Fox News. Fired. That's not, you can't run anything with that. That, nobody had anything over uh, over uh, 500,000 people watching. Mm. That's remarkable. The American people are speaking. The media is just not reflecting it. Right. They're done. Yeah. Go to the places where it is real. You know, I, I was at, uh, up at the house. I was putting in, I bought these old, great lights. I, I love you know, restoration. You are an stuff. LL Bean catalog. That's that's the way I I, I perceive <laughs> your house and ranch just yeah. being a it's a catalog. It's, I like it. I just like old stuff. Mm-hmm. I like old reclaimed stuff. And so uh, I buy. I found these old lights with a wire cage, and they were just beautiful, massive. They were some sort of industry industrial lights, and I'm hanging them over my kitchen counter. And uh, this is up at the farm. And I bought them here in Dallas. And I ship them up, and I'm so thrilled. And I've had to clean them and scrub them and rewire them and everything else. And we're hanging them. And uh, the guy, one of the farmers, he comes in and he said, you're hanging those in your kitchen? And I said, aren't they great? And he said, yeah, if you're a dairy farmer. <laughs> and I said, what? And he's like, that's what's hanging in the barn, uh, the dairy barn. And we are so starved, those of us living in the cities, we're so starved for things that are authentic and really used. And this was coming from a time when men were men and we worked hard and everything else. The people who live in the rest of the country, they're still living with all of that <laughs> stuff. And they're like, <laughs> Really? I mean, I keep saying to all the farmers, everybody I know out in the middle of the country, I'm telling you, I just, I'm going to come with a truck. You give me all of your crap. I'm going to New York City. I'm going to sell it for a fortune and we'll split it. Yeah. yeah. You know, I was, I literally went through a neighbor's, um, he's a guy who, you know, typical farmer, his truck dies, you keep it. You never know if you're going to use that truck or you're going to need the part. So you just keep it. So he's got these great trucks from the sixties and some of them from the fifties, sixties, seventies, and they're beautiful, beautiful. They don't work. And they've been sitting there and it's a crack window and everything else. You know, you'd have to, I'd have to put it on the back of the trailer, but I actually stopped and I'm going through those trucks. And the next time I'm up there, I'm going to go to his house and saying, Look, dude, I, I know you think I'm crazy, but I could make a lot of money <laughs> off these trucks. You want to go in with me? All I have to do is ship it to Los Angeles. They'll buy it for a fortune. Yeah. I can remember the first time I went to Russia in 94. I was in Moscow, and the going uh, craze was American cockroaches. They were bringing these giant New York City cockroaches <laughs> over and selling them as pets. And, and these people loved them. I mean, they were paying that's amazing thousands of rubles, which I mean were just dollar bills yeah. at that point in time. But you know, it just it, they were going crazy over these American cockroaches. And again, it's that perception of what you put value on and what you don't have. and what you don't have. That's exactly right. I want to ask you this, and I'm going to let you go because I know you got to go. Listen, I know you like myself, and you caught flack over it. You know, I said before, during the primaries. I said, trying to figure out which candidate to vote for these days, trying to figure out which venereal disease you're most okay living with for the next four to eight years. And I thought that about Trump, Mm -hmm. certainly thought that about Clinton. And I'm looking at this thing, and I I can remember this old guy at a tire place. I'm having one, and he he looks at me, and he's 80 years old. He says, who are you voting for? And I said, well, Ted Cruz. And he says, well, no, this is the guy that's going to fix the country right here. And he points to a bumper sticker on the back of his Mercedes convertible. It's a Trump sticker. I said, okay. It's, a, it, you know, where we were all at that point. Mm-hmm. I had no idea the groundswell that was coming through this guy who I thought in his speeches was literally saying nothing. 
but we're going to make America great again. Mm -hmm. And how that resonated with people, mm -hmm. with the forgotten Americans who were sick and tired of the mainstream media, who were, who were no longer listening to the lies, who felt like they were being told a false story and narrative, and were sick of politics. And he comes in talking about the swamp and these people that resonated with him. And here we sit. You've caught flack over things you've said over it. You've also come back and said, hey, this is where I think he's done right. I is, said during the election, there's no way this guy's going to do any of this stuff. Yeah. This guy's a freaking nightmare on all levels. Yeah. Uh, and there's no way he's going to do any of this. Uh, you know, I, I, I know who Clinton is, and she's going to be a nightmare and awful. But this guy's going to make conservatives look like this. And I think he's going to do all the New York things that he's always been doing. Mm -hmm. But I also said... But I'll be thrilled if I'm wrong. Yeah. If I'm wrong, I will be the first to admit it because I want the president to succeed. He had no, you had no reason to believe him. You know, he, he is a P.T. Barnum guy and he likes that label. Sure. Um, and he's a salesman. You had no reason, based on the history that he had, to believe anything that he said. People took a huge gamble. Uh, which I thought was a huge gamble, our, our freedom. Mm -hmm. And they saw something that I didn't see. And they also, um, and I think it was born out of more pain than I had. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've always said, I love my audience, but I realized right after the Trump campaign, I don't love my audience. Because I, 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 um, I was mad at them. I was right. mad at them. And when I got past my anger, like, what the hell have you people, what are you thinking? You said you believed these things and you went for this guy. Yeah. I realized I didn't love them because I didn't do the one thing that I always do with anyone I love. And when somebody I love does something out of character, I always stop and say, what's happening in your life? Because some, that's not you. So you've got some pressure going on that's making you see things differently. And that's what, the, that's what everybody missed. That's what I missed. They had a different kind of wisdom because they were farther down the road of this is not going to change with anyone who is from that pool. Mm -hmm. He's the only one that's not in that pool and not afraid to say, screw you. I don't care. I don't care. I've got enough. I don't care if I win or I lose. I, I don't care. I don't care how I look. Oh, I farted on camera. Oh, well, <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's what they saw. And that when they said, it's time to burn everything down, that scared the hell out of me. But what they meant was burn the the system that has been created around the constitution that stops you from getting to the idea that all men are created equal and they have a right to a fair shake and a chance and to keep their own stuff and to go their own way. They want to burn all that framework built around that promise. And that's what he represented. And in many ways, that's what he's doing. And I, I'm always wrong on politics. So, and, I, and I've said uh, to President Trump, I will not endorse you because every time I endorse somebody, they lose. So please do not take this as an endorsement. Uh, and I'm always wrong on, on predicting politics. But there's a chance because the president has done much of the, many of the things that he said he would do. Uh, and when he didn't do it, it's because he actually believed the Republicans were going to actually do something and they cared about the things they campaigned about. They were lying to the people. Mm -hmm. um, and so the thing, some of the things that he didn't do uh, because he was waiting for them to do it. You know, I'll support you. I'll get it done. You know, I'll sign it. You do it. They didn't do it because they didn't believe it. Because he's done those things, because the economy has gone so well, because they were protesting against him before he even took office, 
because they have labeled him a fake president, no president, uh, you know, the worst human being ever to live, Adolf Hitler's son, and they are now looking as though they're at least going to do hearings on impeachment coming up into the election. I think even if the economy turns, and this is new for me, even if the economy turns, I think he's going to have a massive win um, because I think everybody knows the game left and right. Everybody knows the game. Everybody's sick of it. Mm -hmm. Um, And they want somebody who will at least do the things that he says he's going to do. And he does have a record of doing that, which he he didn't have, you know, prior to. And I've said over and over again, and for those of you, people have heard me say it till I'm blue in the face. I don't think he's far right. I think he is a moderate, if anything, left of center guy. I think he's left of center. He's left of center. He's going to make those decisions in order. That's why the Democratic field has to go so far left in order to make him look far right. Mm -hmm. We have to talk about killing babies after birth. I mean, Mm -hmm. this wild and crazy stuff that we never thought would be is is being discussed as as normal conversation. I talked to a guy who's um, who's gay uh, and uh, and and actually had said that you know Donald Trump was a you know a real hater of gays I said he had Peter Thiel do you know the risk he took to put Peter Thiel on the stage with him at the GOP convention and say hey yeah I'm not afraid of saying it he should be married he's gay he's with us I'm with him do you know what a risk that was? Every advisor, every old school advisor was said, no, 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 you can <laughs> you can talk about them amongst themselves, but don't you come out with any of them homosexuals on the stage. That's what I guarantee that's all the advice he got. Yeah. How does that guy yeah. get labeled anti-gay? Yeah. They, they, only because they're so far out of reality. Yeah, I think we're talking a Reagan-esque landslide against Mondale, possibly. Possibly. If this thing goes this way. And and while you say you're bad at picking politics, you're pretty prophetic when it comes to the culture and telling the future. Because I think you predicted that this we were creating a culture that made a Donald Trump possible. I said, um, I watched Barack Obama as he started to rise. He was still losing to Hillary Clinton. And I watched him, how perfect he was mm-hmm. and how flawless he was on teleprompter. I'm good on teleprompter. Mm-hmm. He's very good at teleprompter. And, uh, and I watched him and I said, I was still at CNN at the time, and I said, if this guy wins, the guy who follows him is going to be a big fat guy with a gravy stain on his shirt that's like, hey, yeah, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, let me tell you another thing. Well, that's what we got. I was I I, I saw what's his name uh, from New Jersey, the big fat governor, Chris from New Christie. Chris Christie, and when he started to come up, I thought, that's "There's the, the fat man with the gravy stain." Yeah. He was still too polished. Yeah, this is that guy. So when we swing, and we will, when we swing back, what's the opposite right. that we will gravitate to? Right now. We're not at a place where we'll swing to the opposite. We'll swing harder in that direction. Mm -hmm. You know, if the left wins, it will be someone who is is more intense on destroying the other side Mm -hmm. than Donald Trump is. Yeah. No, I think it's changed the landscape of American politics. It has. At least in our lifetime. That's going to be true. You came out and, and you gave a speech a day prior to Trump at CPAC. Yeah, wound up with a standing ovation on that. Did you feel sort of redeemed in your stance in terms of the audience and the in the conservatives and the in the labels that were there because they embraced you? Yeah, they did. I was surprised by the reaction. Uh-huh. I was surprised by the reaction. I expected, you know, booze and uh, and you know my security going up. I said, guys, we need one guy. We need one guy, and they had three. And I said, we need one. They're like, Mr. Beck, you, you need, sorry. It took 12 to get me out of the hallway in a positive way. Mm-hmm. Um, and that surprised me. That's great. That really surprised me. That's great. You need to get addicted to outrage, Glenn's latest book. I encourage you to get it on audiobook because it's your voice. It's your voice. And nobody <laughs> tells a Glenn Beck story like Glenn Beck. When do they, when Simon & Schuster... They called me and they said, 
uh, you have to re-record these things because that's oh, that's not exactly how it is in the book. And I said, yeah, I know. I wrote the book. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, but you need to say it this way. And I'm like, no. And they said, we won't do it unless you recut it. So I recut it and I recut it exactly the same way over and over and over again until we just ran out of time. Because yeah. it's... it's that's that's a good audio book. I love yeah. that audio book. No, I encourage people to do it. That's that's the way I got it. And uh, our friend Sarah Gonzalez, the News and Why It Matters, she actually recommended to do that. And mm. I said, okay, well, let's do it because I'm on a plane all the time. Let's yeah. listen to it. Get addicted to outrage. Be sure to continue listening to Glenn Beck Radio. Hey, subscribe to Blaze TV. Why I'm so not? thrilled I mean, that you're here. Got to do it. Me too. I just so love it. It's it's so much more fun than I. And people get it on to me all the time. They're like, "Well, you're not in the truck anymore." Well, I am. It's just a censorship of Facebook. I mean, I don't deserve to be here in terms of that. But I have a. I'm like you in the sense that I believe that I speak with a conviction. And at the end of the day, I really don't care. I'm okay to be wrong at times. I'm okay to be right at we're times. We're all wrong but at, at times. The, but at the same time, flip a coin. We're all going to do it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I appreciate it. And I appreciate your time. Appreciate you coming in. It's always a blast. You're always welcome. And, and uh, hey, we're in this thing together. So yeah. rock and roll. Hopefully the ship stays afloat. For the guys over here running this thing, Candice, the queen of Ethiopians, the brains behind the whole program, and, of course, the puppet master over there, Martin. Party foul, Steve. I saw, I saw you. I saw, I saw the closet door open when he started talking about homosexuals yeah, over there, that, Steve. That, I, I, that's I, what did it. <laughs> <laughs> Kick the door open. Yeah. I know. For the folks here at Studio 22, Glenn Beck, thanks for sitting down with us. We will see you next time. We love y'all. God bless. Bye.